The need to conduct an internal investigation arises in all organizations. Done properly, an investigation can help identify wrongdoing and correct the issue. But done poorly, the investigation can be detrimental in terms of bad publicity, loss of employee morale, and a continuation of the problem. The primary purpose of any internal investigation is to improve the factual decision-making capability of management. This training will help ensure that your investigation process is systematic and streamlined. This course is brought to you by Prevent Harassment LLC, dedicated to a professional and respectful workplace. Today's course will cover several topics. First of all, ensuring that an objective and confidential investigation occurs. We'll also talk about responding to the initial complaint and then conducting the investigation, interviewing witnesses, and creating documentation and maintaining records. We'll also talk about drawing a conclusion and managing the aftermath of the investigation. Ensuring an objective and confidential investigation. To get us started, here's a harassment prevention checklist. Develop a written policy that defines prohibited conduct. Effectively communicate this policy to all employees and train management and employees on sexual as well as other types of harassment, discrimination, as well as retaliation. Develop a confidential means of reporting harassment, offering multiple avenues of complaint, and conduct a prompt, thorough, and discreet investigation in response to any complaints you receive. The objectives of an investigation are that the investigation be thorough, prompt, and demonstrate fairness and objectivity. We'll talk about each of these elements. Promptness matters in an investigation, so make sure that you initiate an investigation as soon as possible. And remember that waiting to commence an investigation longer than necessary probably would not be considered prompt remedial action. And a prompt investigation reaffirms an employer's anti-harassment policy. So in order for your employer to be able to assert the affirmative defense, you have to show that you took each and every allegation seriously. Thoroughness matters in your investigation, so don't wait for a complaint to be lodged, and don't allow your internal investigation to undermine reasonable avenues for complaints. Thorough and careful investigations send a message to employees that the employer has an effective complaint handling procedure and takes all complaints of harassment or discrimination seriously. Don't forget to offer multiple avenues of complaint a supervisor, an HR person, or any management representative. But don't require an employee to go to one specific person to lodge a complaint. Also, thoroughness means that you're going to interview each witness that has material knowledge of the concern. And then finally, follow through. After an investigation has been completed and the final report has been submitted, advise the complaining party of the outcome of the investigation. Take appropriate disciplinary action against the harasser if wrongdoing is confirmed and provide any necessary training, counseling, and support to ensure the complainant that cooperating employees have not be, been subjected to reprisal for their role in the investigation. Remember that effective training in response to a singular incident will demonstrate to a jury the organization's commitment to preventing sexual harassment or any other form of harassment. We'll go through each of these steps in this training. Responding to the initial complaint. Be sure your employees know exactly how to file a complaint, where they go, to whom they talk, and what they report. This should be covered in your policy and any harassment prevention training class. Hopefully the employees feel comfortable coming to their supervisor or HR with the information. This indicates a level of trust and credibility. If you receive anonymous complaints, those must be taken seriously as well but it's more difficult to address those if details are not provided. The manager's role. Any person who receives a complaint should be well-versed on the legal and practical issues of what to say and how to respond. This information should be covered in harassment prevention training. As representatives of management, managers, supervisors, executives, and any team leaders should be trained to listen to the facts and direct the employee to the appropriate person usually an HR or employee relations person. Managers are not the best choice for an investigation. HR's role. 
The HR person should be well-versed in conducting an investigation. This person should have a higher level of skill and knowledge and be able to initiate an objective and confidential investigation. In a conversation with a complaining employee, the person receiving the complaint should begin taking factually detailed notes. Once the complainant has finished articulating his or her concern, they should be asked to generate a document that reflects all issues raised. Explain that the document will serve to avoid confusion or misunderstandings and to clarify issues of concern with the complainant. Be careful not to commit to conducting an investigation at this initial meeting, as an informal resolution may still be possible. When an employee comes forward with a complaint, you can ask them to gen generate a document that reflects all of their concerns, and if possible, obtain a written statement of the complaint. If the complainant is not willing to write or sign a complaint, then the investigator should prepare a written summary of the complaint and make an effort to have the complainant confirm that the investigator's recitation of the complaint is accurate. Ask the complainant to provide the following information. The name of the complainant, including any organizational and contact details, such as title, department, location, phone number, email. Get the name of the complainant's supervisor and their details, and the name of the complainant's manager and their details. Get the name of the alleged perpetrators and their title, department, location, phone number, email, if known, and a summary of all the issues, concerns, or complaints. Ask the employee for a chronologically detailed account of the alleged issues with dates, times, places, and any first-hand witnesses to the events. Also get a list of people the complainant suggests may have relevant information to the allegation and whether the information is first-hand or hearsay. Finally, get a list of all documentation and physical evidence the complainant can provide or that should be acquired to support the allegations being made. For example, you might want notes or logs of events, performance reviews, any corrective action documentation, or any other documentation the complainant might think is important. In some cases, a complainant may not be able or willing to fill out the initial complaint form on their own. In this case, you may need to collect the information over the phone. I would not suggest collecting information via email. If this is the case, make sure that you get a complete account of what's going on and make sure that you're asking all the questions that are, that are included on the initial complaint form and generate the initial complaint form on your own. If you have the initial complaint generated, ask the complainant to review the document. If the complainant requests any changes to enhance the clarity of the documentation, then certainly add them. However, if the complainant wishes to delete certain information, note this, but do not remove the initial allegations. Requests for removal of information may indicate that the complainant provided misleading information initially or that someone in the work environment is applying appropriate pressure. Ask the complainant to sign the revised document, and if they refuse, date and sign the report yourself, noting the complainant's refusal to sign. Now let's get into conducting the actual investigation. In preparing for the investigation, make sure you're ready for witness interviews and know how to respond to questions. Be prepared for the why me question from your witnesses. Why are you investigating this particular witness? What information or evidence do you hope to obtain? Decide beforehand whether you're going to disclose the entire reason for the interview or decide whether that would compromise your overall strategy. Also decide if an introductory document or script will be used. That can often be helpful in guiding the conversation. Also decide as part of your strategic planning if consequences for failure to cooperate will apply. If so, make sure you have a clearly written and communicated policy on this issue and that the corrective actions chosen are consistent with past actions concerning similar sets of facts with similarly situated employees. Recognize that witnesses will have worries about what your agenda really is and whether they may become the target of your investigation. This can be either an advantage or a disadvantage. It can restrict the flow of information as witnesses attempt to protect themselves, or it can enhance the flow if they attempt to demonstrate teamwork and cooperation. 
In any case, be aware of the leverage that can be derived from uncertainty. Be ready to take advantage of unscheduled interviews. In spite of all the advantages of advanced preparation for a structured interview, don't overlook any spontaneous opportunities to obtain valuable information. Whenever appropriate, make yourself available in locations frequented by employees. When an aggrieved employee walks into your office to describe a problem, seize the moment. Postponing that visit may discourage certain disclosures and the source may be lost forever. If you are approached in an informal manner, be sure to conduct a follow-up interview with your co-investigator to formalize the information, also gathering any documentation or evidence using a forensic chain of custody. It's important to convey to all employees that are interviewed that the company takes every allegation of harassment or discrimination seriously. Be factual. It may only call into question the sincerity of your inquiry. Do not discuss your opinions and avoid making premature conclusions. Creating documentation and maintaining records. During the investigation, notes will be taken for many different reasons. The most typical being the interview notes for each person with whom the investigators have a dialogue. Interview notes should only contain factual information gathered as a result of the meeting with the witness. Often documents created as part of the normal course of business can be very useful to investigators and can lend strong support to post-investigation actions. Consider the following materials as you review and compile investigative documents. Personnel files, supervisor's notes, written company procedures, posted information, employee handbooks, collective bargaining agreements, and certainly email messages or texts. Be sure to examine these documents if they have any impact on the issues raised in your investigation. It's vitally important to be aware of documents that reflect poorly upon your organization as early as possible in the, in the investigation process. And assume that all documents are discoverable in litigation, unless the document is protected by the attorney-client privilege. That means be prepared to have the accused and his or her attorney scrutinize every piece of paper generated in your investigation. Exercise care not to waive the attorney-client privilege by, disclose, by disclosing privileged and confidential materials. In terms of record retention, remember that documentation created or collected during the course of an investigation should be retained for a significant length of time, usually the length of employment plus seven years. Once an investigation is completed, the documentation should be under the control of counsel to help protect the attorney-client privilege. The retention of investigative notes should be documented in the organization's policies and procedures manual for conducting internal investigations, and should litigation occur, the documentation should be retained indefinitely. As you review your documentation, prior to making your final report, look over the files you've gathered and determine if there are conflicting statements. Remove anything that is not relevant that is, does not tend to prove or disprove the allegation being investigated. Be sure to safeguard all documents collected by placing them in a confidential place where access is only allowed on a need-to-know basis. That is, access could be provided to a company lawyer, the CEO, the HR director, or an outside investigator. If you're investigating a discrimination complaint, you may need to gather current demographic information on a group or a department. How have employees in the same protected class as the claimant fared in terms of pay, benefits, and promotions compared with other employees? And how have other members of the protected class fared who report to the same manager or supervisor as the claimant? As you go about gathering all types of evidence, you should mentally compose your thorough, non-privileged final investigation report. Examples of information you want to include are a description of the alleged wrongdoing, and a description of the policies, procedures, as well as federal, state, and local laws that are applicable, a description of the physical, documentary, and testimonial evidence examined, and a summary of the information elicited, a determination about the credibility where there are conflicts in the testimony, and finally, findings of fact on the totality of credible evidence. While identifying relevant facts, the investigator should begin identifying and analyzing which policies, procedures, or laws have allegedly been violated. 
The task then becomes determining whether the facts support or refute the alleged violations of policy and or law. Now let's talk about taking appropriate disciplinary action based upon your final report. In the first case, when the facts alleged have not occurred. When it is determined that facts alleged have not occurred, it is best to take a neutral approach with both employees involved in the investigation and to discuss why the conclusion was drawn. Emphasize that the investigation results are based on the evidence presented. Review the company's policies and procedures with each employee and discuss the issues of retaliation and reprisal. The complainant should be assured that even though the investigation in this case turned out as it did, future complaints of misconduct will also be treated seriously and will be promptly and thoroughly investigated. When the facts alleged have occurred, you want to take additional steps. When it is determined that facts alleged have occurred, the employer should take prompt corrective action. Whether the incident was minor or egregious, the alleged harasser must be disciplined. Disciplinary action can range from warnings, preferably written warnings, to dismissal. The complainant should be told that appropriate action has been taken against the harasser and the importance of reporting future alleged incidences should be reinforced. However, don't give specifics to the complainant about the disciplinary action that was taken. And when an intentionally false complaint has been made, you want to be extra careful. If it's determined that the complaint was intentionally contrived to injure the alleged perpetrator, the employer must consider whether discipline should be taken against the complainant. My advice is to consult with legal counsel before disciplining the complainant. And when your investigation is inconclusive, and you are unable to determine whether or not the facts alleged did occur, you want to be careful as well. Where no clear determination of the facts can be made, the principal parties should be advised. This should be done in a neutral manner. Both parties should be advised that misconduct, retaliation, and reprisal are unlawful, and that the employer will protect the claimant as well as others from such conduct. Further, the claimant should be advised that future incidences of misconduct must continue to be reported and that the employer will treat each complaint seriously. Both parties should be advised that all employees are required to observe and comply with all the employer's policies and procedures. The employer may wish to review the policy with both employees to reinforce the seriousness of the matter. And in addition, the employer may wish to explore the possibility of separating the parties by transfer so as to avoid future contact between them. However, be careful that neither party is subjected to adverse action. Finally, the employer may wish to use the incident as a springboard for recommunicating the organization's policies and procedures to the remainder of the workforce. The amount of specific information broadcast should be enough so that the staff understands that an incident has occurred and has been investigated, but not enough to establish a basis for a defamation claim from one of the principal parties. My advice is to tread cautiously when communicating any information about the investigation. A copy of any corrective action documentation should be placed in the personnel file of any employee that was disciplined as a result of a definitive investigation. But the full investigation record should be kept in a separate file in a confidential secured area. This document is not considered to be a personnel record. On conclusions and managing the aftermath of the investigation. This information will assist the employer's defense in a wrongful termination claim. Whenever possible, identify the specific rule or policy the misconduct violated. And if there were more than one reason to justify termination, do not pick and choose which information to inform the employee of. Cite each of the multiple grounds that support the termination decision. And remember, if you decide not to give the employee a written copy of the reason for discipline or discharge and instead verbally communicate the basis, record it somewhere in the employee's personnel file. Because as they say, if, it, if you didn't write it down, it didn't happen. And this information is discoverable during an administrative investigation or a lawsuit. Employers must be prepared to defend the discharge on the basis told to the employee and the basis recorded if the two reasons differ at all. Clearly articulate the basis for any corrective action if you're reporting to employees. Many employers fail to identify or articulate the reasons for discipline or termination, 
and instead employers sometimes cite reasons that for discipline they cannot prove or substantiate. At the same time, they overlook provable reasons that would justify termination. Remember your investigation goals to obtain the facts and determine whether the misconduct has taken place. It is important to summarize your findings and the disciplinary action directly related to these findings. Providing an employee with vague reasons for their dismissal or discipline will only hurt an employer if the employment decision is ultimately challenged in court. A more difficult task involves determining what is appropriate discipline. The severity of the discipline must be appropriate to the violations, and several factors should be considered. The egregiousness or seriousness of the conduct, including what occurred, the length of time over which it occurred, and the responses of the involved parties. The more egregious the behavior, the more likely that demotion, suspension, or termination will be appropriate. The hostility involved, for example, was that an improper joke or a criminal assault. The harm caused to the victim. If the victim suffered little harm, discipline may be less severe. The harasser's employment record. Similar prior behavior will support more severe discipline. And whether the harasser was aware of the employer's relevant policy. You will also want to review the discipline that was imposed on in similar cases to ensure we have consistency and also review other employer policies, procedures, or union contracts that relate to the progressive disciplinary process. When determining appropriate disciplinary action, you want to select a disciplinary action that fits the infraction, and when possible, have someone else validate your conclusion. If the decision is going to be made in conjunction with others, meet with those individuals and jointly develop a recommendation. And if discipline does not include termination, the employer should monitor the situation to be certain that no further harassment occurs and the complainant is not subjected to reprisal or retaliation. If further harassment or retaliation does occur, additional disciplinary actions are warranted, up to and including termination. Terminations are a difficult and unpleasant task. Often the employee has been employed by the organization for several years, and personal feelings and ordinary human emotion must be taken into account. When possible, include appropriate management in the decision-making process and consider using a termination checklist to ensure that your process is systematic. Avoid these issues. First of all, surprise. Surprise to the individual's manager. Make sure that they're looped in. Also, opening the floor to arguments in favor of or against termination. Your termination decision is final and there's no equivocation. Also avoid unnecessary publication of disparaging facts. Obviously, you want to avoid a defamation complaint. Be sure your policy states in no uncertain terms that employees are required to cooperate in all workplace investigations deemed necessary by the employer. Failure to cooperate or sabotage of an investigation can be grounds for corrective action, up to and including termination. Certainly a cause for concern is retaliatory behavior. It is the employer's responsibility to ensure that retaliation does not occur. When the complainant and the accused are informed of the investigation's results, both should be advised of the organization's strong policy against retaliation. Complainants should be told to report any conduct that they think is retaliatory. They should also be told to report any continuation of the conduct that caused the initial complaint to be made. To further ensure that retaliation does not occur, the organization should follow up with a complainant on a regular basis giving the complainant ample opportunity to report any retaliatory conduct. And these meetings should be documented. Now let's summarize the information in this investigations module. Investigations, when done correctly, can keep an internal problem from becoming an external one. They can also mitigate morale and productivity issues and prevent the problem from spiraling out of control. Certainly done well, an investigation can avoid legal and financial liability. But a poorly conducted investigation can decimate morale, lower productivity, and increase the likelihood of litigation and legal liability, and can certainly be very costly. Yet another potential problem is that an investigation may create divisiveness when employees are asked to comment about activities of supervisors and colleagues, 
or to disclose information that is harmful to a coworker. Work with legal counsel to ensure that your investigatory process is solid and seek their assistance in every incident that arises. This video was provided for instructional use only and is not intended as legal advice. It is provided as a service of Prevent Harassment, LLC. We can be found at uspreventharassment.com.